Well, um, I uh, I am pleased to be here today, and um, I really I really appreciate um, in a very deep way uh, my uh, my long friendship with uh, Linda and and the opportunity to um, to be here and uh, just share a few of, of my memories and um, and you know and notice that I've got uh, since it's well known that uh, Boulder is a suburb of uh, Patagonia that um, I, I came prepared uh, so um, 40 years where did they go and you know, I, I thought, well, maybe one way to get this uh, started is is just to, to think of one line um, that uh, reminds me of Linda uh, whenever I hear it, whenever I think it. And um, and 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 that that just came instantly to me um, when whenever I've been with Linda, uh, either in a work or um, social setting um, that. I, I'm always amazed uh, that how well she makes me think. Um, and while that may not sound like, uh, you know, a very profound statement, but every time I'm around Linda, um, I feel like I'm an old, like, IBM 7075 uh, mainframe machine uh, at that baud rate. And, and Linda is deep blue. <laughs> <laughs> She makes me think, and and for that, I've always been grateful. That's one reason why I think our friendship, why our uh, collaborations uh, were as productive and uh, and long-lasting as they were. So when I sat down to try to put this uh, this presentation together, I, I, um, I thought, well, all right, I need to get some photos of uh, Linda. So I went online, and I uh, started uh, looking at, um, you know, all of what comes up. And when I Googled Linda, um, and it was the right Linda Mearns, and believe it or not, there are other Linda Mearns um, around the country. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, that surprised me um, that, that, because I've always thought of you as a singularity. But, um, but, but the, first, the first things I find are this and this. This is all under Linda Mearns, uh, the person. This, and I'm thinking, is there a person behind all this? It was finally I got this one, and that's where I wanted to be in the first place. So that's that's the person that I'm going to celebrate today. Um, and I want to start really by um, you know shouting out to a whole cadre uh, of us uh, geographers who started our careers back in the early '80s, um, and we uh, while we may not have stayed together tightly bound uh, throughout our careers. Um, we always have appreciated um, each other for not only as uh, colleagues uh, to collaborate with, but also just as friends. Um, and they, the usual suspects, um, Tom Downing at, uh, at Oxford, uh, although he's moved on from there, um, Stuart Cohen, um, from Environment Canada, just recently retired. Um, Bill, who's with us, um, and um, Diana, also with us. And and I, I, I really honestly tried to find younger pictures for all of us, but I could not find them anywhere on the web. I, I apologize. Uh, me, I really look a lot younger than this. And, <laughs> but I've got the same sweater on. Um, and I, I, I add Cynthia in on our group because I consider her an honorary geographer um, in every sense of the word. And then, of course, the inevitable, inevitable uh, Linda Mearns. And, and through the years, we have stayed not tightly connected, but, uh, but we've been, um, you know, we've watched each other uh, through the years achieve great things. And, um, and applauded each other. So what was our science like back in the 1980s? Um, and when you, when you think back, or at least when I think back, I started my career as a uh, Mellon Foundation fellow with the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate at the Academy. And most of uh, what we dealt with in uh, the year and a half I was there 
was this part of the climate change um, challenge um, fully coupled earth system models, or at least the attempt to get there. And the, uh, the work that I was doing and that most of us, this cadre were, was doing, was kind of here where Bob Cates used to say that we were sort of like uh, at the back of the bus. Now, that's changed. I mean, amazing how much that has changed in the 40 years. But, uh, but we're now a vital part of, uh, and this, this started to, to evolve even back in the 80s. Uh, this is a very famous uh, diagram often referred to, as I know many of you know, uh, the, the Bretherton um, diagram. Francis Bretherton um, proposed this in, a, uh, in an academy report. And you notice that human activities, um, which had been missing in min much of the work prior, um, was, was there, although in a very different kind of, um, of box and format. But nonetheless, the respect was, uh, was paid. And it was really up to us in the community to begin to start to uh, build out a, uh, a body of scholarship, which we have certainly done over the past um, 40 years. And now, Linda and I were particularly interested in a, uh, in a, a, a piece of the, uh, of the interaction of humans with, uh, with the climate that attempts to understand how to scale models that begin at the GCM scale of, uh, let's just say, three by five flat lawn, um, often used to adjust a baseline and then uh, a climate, and then put into a crop model that is usually operating at the scale resolution of a hectare or a single plant, depending on the model. And that was really the state of the science in the, uh, in the 80s. And of course, the output was the farmer and the farmer's uh, unfortunate uh, inability to uh, adapt to the climate changes that were occurring. So that's what the state was um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, the temporal scale of the models um, were largely determined by um, model defaults um, in the uh, crop models. And um, adaptation, if it was modeled at all, was assumed to occur instantaneously as the climate evolved, as if the farmers were totally clairvoyant. Well, see, there are dumb farmers. And that was, that was uh, you know, my old mentor, Norm Rosenberg, uh, used to refer to farmer uh, modeling schemes where you didn't allow for any adaptation whatsoever. In goes the climate change to a crop model, out goes the crop uh, yield, and that's the story. Um, so we referred to that as the dumb farmer in the day. Clairvoyant adaptation, on the other hand, was as I described, the climate changes, there's instantaneous adaptation optimized for the changing climate, and then we calculate a yield impact. So that's the, it was those sort of endpoints that we, we tended to operate in, um, in the, uh, in the eighties. And it was in that time that Linda and I forged uh, our partnership. We, we obviously had a very um, tight and um, interest in uh, the importance of scale in uh, climate and impact modeling. And GCMs were still very coarse resolution, at least those uh, GCM experiments that we could get our hands on to do any kind of modeling with. And two other things started happening or happened at the same time, necessary conditions. Uh, one was um, I had convinced uh, then Senator Kerry uh, of Nebraska to help us acquire a DOE uh, Global Change Research Center in, uh, in Lincoln. And Linda had the presence of mine to be one of my first uh, PIs to um, propose a, a very well-reviewed study that looked at the, um, 
the the impact of scale on modeling climate and uh, crop yields. And she also had the presence of mind to make me, the director of the Institute, a co-PI. So it was funded. And this is, and Linda will, will remember this uh, because she, I think, probably designed it. But this was out of some work that um, followed on to our initial studies where we, we, we were trying to understand the scale mismatch between climate and plant growth models um, in the southeastern US. And here, here's the nub of the, of the problem we were addressing. The, the regional climate model um, that Filippo should have talked about and set me up for this, um, and will, so we'll circle back to that and you'll remember this moment. Um, was um, the background grid. And then Linda and I were working with the Australian CSIRO model uh, as a, uh, as a um, climate GCM model. And we were trying to figure out how to get the best resolution of scale for a crop model within this kind of framework. So the regional model gave us at least half a degree resolution. And uh, that was pretty big, a pretty good resolution for, a, uh, for a, a modeling study in that day. And yet the crop growth model is uh, operating at the scale of a hectare, one one hundredth of a kilometer. So we, we were at least making an honest effort at trying to see where on the continuum we got the best agreement between yields that we observe and yields that we model when we're going to different levels of spatial resolution. And that's really kind of the, the theme for Linda's and my research um, throughout. And we were using a model called EPIC. Some of you may be familiar. It's now known as the Environmental Policy and Integrated uh, Climate Model. And it, is or it is uh, operating at a daily time step in a scale of one one hectare. So I'm not going to go through a lot of you know graphs and uh, model results. That's not the point here. Um, we were asking our simulated yield responses to low resolution climate change with and without adaptation significantly different from yield responses to high resolution. Very simple, does scale matter? We got two flagship papers um, out of this um, in climatic change uh, in uh, the early 2000s. And our collaboration continued on for um, more than 10 co-authored papers, which my, my resume, since I took a right turn uh, about halfway through my career and went into a dean's office, um, that's more than uh, a fifth of my total publication record. <laughs> and we got funded by DOE, by NASA, EPA. Um, you know, Linda was really taking the lead on all of this. And our focus mainly Great Plains in the southeastern U.S. And we we learned some things that um, were new in the literature that um, scale resolution can actually take a positive and turn it into a negative in terms of uh, the climate effect on yields, depending on how you aggregate. Um, and we also tried some pretty wonky things as well. And I don't know, how much time do I have left? All right. Um, one of the things that I really liked about Linda was that uh, even though we were um, funded to do some very specific uh, work with specific goals and objectives, and anyone who gets funded by a mission agency that is not NSF um, knows that you have to kind of toe the line and get um, you know the the research done and answer the questions that need to be answered uh, for the uh, the funding agency. And yet 
I was more interested at this point in trying to apply some of my human geography um, about um, innovation diffusion um, to make what I considered um, the rate at which farmers adopt new um, innovative uh, practices that are aligned with an evolving climate change as a pretty legitimate research question. It was a little off target from what Linda and I were um, supposed to be doing, but I did it anyway. And so I, I decided to try to apply the epidemiological, the classic logistic model um, of um, diffusion uh, to the diffusion of adaptation capability um, by farmers. And I'm not going to get through all this in eight minutes, so I won't bore you with a lot of results, but there are a lot of empirical examples from the literature of the lag, the known distributed lag in which uh, farmers uh, take up new innovative uh, technologies. Tillage practices on a rate of about one once every five years or so, and new cultivars, this I know a little bit about, um, anywhere from 10 to 12 years because you have to develop the cultivar, the cultivar has to be tested, and then eventually marketed um, 10 years. So adaptation, even if the climate is changing dramatically in front of you, um, there are certain sectors of the agricultural adaptation industry, so to speak, that cannot keep pace with that rate of change uh, under normal practices. Now, I don't know what COVID and the ability to get a vaccine out in one year will do to all this, but it's an interesting thought. So I tried to test this. And what we did was um, we simulated maize yields um, with a baseline climate across the, uh, the Southeast and, um, and in that day, we did not have access to transient climate changes um, in the impact modeling community, at least not readily available to Linda and me. So I manufactured a transient climate change. And I don't want any of the climatologists in here to, um, to, to give me a hard time about this because it was a, it was a, um, you know, a demonstration effort of what it would be like if the pathway from here to doubled CO2 equivalent uh, climate were just a linear path, which we know it won't be. What would it, if you could make it into a, what I call a mock climate change and, um, and then test at different stages of that progression from um, a third of the change, two thirds of the change, and then finally the full change. Um, whether or not distributing the yield, and, and again, I wanna keep us on time. Um, this is be what it would look like, waves of um, innovation um, over time. This is a classic innovation diffusion uh, model on the top part of the graph where um, it's divided up into a hypothetical 60 years of, um, of simulation and, um, and waves of new technologies coming in with each of the new logistic curves. And that some of the farmers are right on spot and adapt right away. Um, some take maybe five years to kind of get on board. Some take 10 and the rest somewhere between 20, 10 and 20 years. And they're the ones whose goose is cooked, um, sort of in cyberspace at least. And, um, and distributing all of the adaptations um, across this type of, um, of array and um, seeing whether or not it made any difference in the modeled yields. And the big lead up here is that, why well, yes, it made a big difference. But the truth is the difference between that distributed lag called logistic adaptation as we modeled it and clairvoyant adaptation um, as had been the practice to that point was um, very, very small. And in the end, 
It just wasn't as meaningful. And even though it didn't really, I, I expected great things, um, it didn't yield dissimilar results. And um, sometimes what we thought would be a brilliant, that this was gonna win me membership in the National Academy, <laughs> <laughs> just wasn't worth the extra effort. So sorry, Linda, it was back to the drawing board. So thank you so much. Um, I hope I've done some justice to our our collaboration and our long friendship. And it was it was a hoot. I, you know, I wish it could go on some more, but um, I don't know, maybe it will. Thank you very much. Okay, I'd say we have time for one or two questions or comments if anyone in the audience or online has anything they wanna say. Um, are we turning on the, okay, so the microphone is on, on the room so you can just speak loudly and Bill, that was just amazing. I really appreciate all the work you put into that. That was great. And one small correction on that vaccine for COVID, there's 15 years of development or more before that. And so it looked like it was a one year effort, but there was a long standing research program before there. So it fits right in with what you were talking about, about the long time. It you know, is. thank you so much for that because I knew that. Uh, I knew that um, PCR and all that technology that uh, made that tremendous success um, possible uh, in one year um, really was uh, evolved out of what, um, early 2000s. Um, and so, yeah, I. Yeah, it was more, it was also specifically mRNA vaccines. I was taking poetic that. license. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got one more. So in the, since we have the benefit of hindsight and since climate is changing, do you have an idea of what are farmers actually doing in terms of adapting? <clears throat> are they changing practices with in, in, in you know, <laughs> quickly or slowly or what's the... Well, yes, they are adapting. Mm -hmm. um, but the question is, um, are they, and, and I can't answer the question with data. Um, this is just my sense from, I have a joint appointment in our um, Department of Agronomy and mm -hmm. So I occasionally will go over and masquerade as a knowledgeable scientist over there. And, um, <laughs> and they, they, they will say that um, a lot of the adaptations and, um, and changes in the, in, you know, particularly when you talk about genetic uh, modification are, are, are evolving um, to address climate change without really knowing that they're doing it or without a conscious effort to make that type of uh, change happen in order to um, evolve a uh, better adapted cultivar. So, um, you know, there's been work going on in drought tolerance uh, forever, mm -hmm. and it will continue forever. And the question is, is our knowledge of what's happening with climate change um, accelerating that? Mm -hmm. um, well, maybe indirectly it is because there's maybe more money now um, being invested uh, toward that end uh, in the research uh, sector, but I'm only, that's just a shot in the dark. Autonomous adaptation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. clear as a conscious or implemented. And, and, and if somebody has a different uh, view of this, speak up, but that's my sense. I'm really happy to be able to say a few words about uh, my friendship with Linda which I think goes back to uh, about 40 years, I think. I came to Enka in 1984, <clears throat> and I, I think she was already there. Uh, and we were together a lot. We published a lot of papers together, I think uh, more than 20. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the early days of, uh, of uh, our friendship. Uh, in those early days, we used to, we liked to call ourselves the dynamic duo that you can see there. Uh, we actually never figured out who was Batman and who was Robin. I kind of like a uh, little bit better Robin's outfit. So uh, I think, and I'm a bit younger than, than Linda. So I probably am Robin and she is Batman. Um, it's just kind of a joke that we always uh, used to do. Um, this is what, uh, I mean, in some ways we were very complimentary to each other. Um, uh, I, as you, as you, as you uh, probably know, I uh, am a regional 
climate modeler. I always worked more on the physical side of climate science. And uh, Linda worked on the uh, uh, on the next step, uh, going from, from the climate uh, to the impact side. And, and Bill has already uh, talked about that. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, first thing I wanted to talk about how did actually regional climate modeling, uh, uh, how was it, uh, how did it come out? So if you go to the next slide, uh, the reason why we developed our first regional model that was at Anchor, in fact, was because of this uh, Yakka Mountain project. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, know about this project. Uh, I don't know if they actually ever built this uh, nuclear waste uh, repository in this site. Anyway, Yakka Mountain is a site in Southern Nevada, not far from uh, Las Vegas. Um, and they, um, I guess what they wanted to do back then, so I'm talking about 40 years ago, and I don't know if this is still the case, they wanted to build a uh, repository, nuclear waste repository, like 500 meters under the, uh, the ground. Uh, and the question they were asking the climate modelers was whether climate change might actually uh, modify the hydrology of the site. For example, if uh, precipitation would increase, then you would have uh, more infiltration and uh, and the water could be um, uh, could, could come in touch with uh, with the radioactive uh, material. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, you see what we had back then at our disposal to do this. Uh, in the upper left corner, upper left panel, you see uh, the resolution of the global model we had back then, uh, the CCM1. I don't know if there is anyone there who remembers this model, but the resolution of the CCM1 was about uh, 500 kilometers. Uh, you see the topography of the CCM1. Um, and you see that all the Western US topography was kind of uh, blended in into uh, one uh, big hill, I would say. Uh, the red dot is the location of uh, Yakka Mountain. One reason why they, they uh, chose Yakka Mountain is that it's in the, lee, in the uh, downwind side of the Sierra Nevadas. And so there is the precipitation shadowing effect. And that's one reason why it's so, it's so dry there. But in the global model, the um, as you can see, not only uh, the Sierra Nevadas are not there, but the uh, Yakka Mountain is actually in the upslope uh, side of this hill. So instead of being uh, having less precipitation there in the model, in the in the global model, it had more. So with a group of people that I will show, we thought that uh, we might actually, uh, how to say, apply uh, what was uh, what had already been used in uh, in uh, numerical weather prediction. Um, to uh, to climate uh, prediction or climate change simulations, this um, this uh, nesting technique, which was very well known already in the in, uh, NWP research. Back then, uh, we had a uh, mesoscale model called MM4. I don't know if Bill Quo is there, but uh, Bill Quo was one of the uh, developers of uh, MM4 together with Ricantis. I had used MM4 because uh, I was um, working on this nuclear winter issue for my uh, PhD dissertation, I, and I put smoke into the MM4. Um, so when this problem came up, uh, uh, Bob Dickinson, who was leading a small group working on this, uh, called me up and said, uh, you know, now nobody cares. I mean, the Berlin Wall had just fell, and so he said nobody cares about uh, nuclear winter anymore, but we have another very interesting problem. Um, and that's how we say we thought of doing this uh, this uh, regional climate modeling or or downscaling. I, I will not talk about it. I assume that all of you know what it actually basically is. Uh, you what you can see in the uh, up uh, right corner is the topography of the model we had back then. The resolution was about fifty kilometers, and you can actually uh, see that the Sierra Nevadas at least <clears throat> they're there. They're not that steep but at least they are there. So if you go to the next slide, essentially what we did was uh, uh, to borrow uh, this technique uh, that back then we called the one-way nesting. Uh, I know that Linda never liked actually the word uh, nesting. Um, she was using some other word, I don't remember which one, but uh, um, 
or the driving model, she used to call it the mother model or something. Um, but anyways, what you have, you have your, uh, your GCM, you run your GCM first, uh, you take the meteorological output from the GCM every six hours, three hours, whatever you have. Uh, you uh, interpolate it onto the grid of the regional model, especially the boundary of the regional model. You apply boundary conditions. Uh, back then, the MM4 had uh, a Newtonian term and a relaxation term, um, and then you run the model. Again, this was or this had already been done in NWP, but never applied to uh, to uh, climate uh, climate simulations. If you go to the next slide, this, this one first, you see the difference in topography, and then the next one. This is the team of people that actually worked uh, in developing the first uh, NCAR, really uh, regional climate model, which we call the REGCM and the specifically REXIM-1. Then over the years, still when I was at Anchor, we developed the REXIM-2 and REXIM-2.5. Uh, you see some characters here. Uh, maybe you recognize uh, Rick Antis to the, uh, uh, to the left, uh, Bob Dickinson to the right, uh, Bill Kuo just uh, um, below Bob Dickinson, uh, Ron Errico, just uh, below this GCM, uh, this big bowl of, you know, the GCM model. Uh, I don't know where he is now, actually, but um, he looked very happy back then. Uh, then on top, you can see myself and uh, Gary Bates, who was a uh, really very important uh, part of our uh, modeling team. Back then, he was, I think, a support scientist uh, working with me for a long time. And uh, in the uh, upper left uh, panel, you can see a bunch of very happy people. Uh, uh, Christine Shields is there. I think Christine is uh, probably in the room somewhere. So you can see, um, I think we were having dinner somewhere in Boulder and uh, Gary and Larry McDaniel. Uh, and of course, Linda is there. Uh, Eric Small, other people that worked with, uh, and uh, Maria Rosaria Marinucci with uh, my son, um, and Stephanie Scherer, who was uh, back then uh, our section secretary. Uh, so the idea that this group of people uh, wanted to, uh, to, to use uh, was not what is today called regional climate modeling. Uh, and why was this? Because um, the NWP people, in and in this group in particular, Ron and, and Bill, were not convinced that you could actually run uh, nested models for long simulation times. Uh, usually in NWP research, they are run for uh, three days, five days, and something like that. So the original idea was to actually look at the GCM output, uh, select the storms from the GCM, and then run uh, the regional model for the lifetime of the storm, which would be like three to five days. Uh, so we started doing that. But at some point, I remember uh, very well, uh, one day uh, I and Gary were sitting in, uh, in my office and uh, we said, oh, we're kind of tired of doing this, you know, three day runs. Uh, for one thing, there was always the problem of uh, how do you initialize soil moisture? Uh, the hydrologic cycle was never in uh, uh, equilibrated. Uh, the model was always in uh, spin-up mode and so on. So we said, why don't we actually try to run a longer simulation, something that we called uh, in, in climate mode. Uh, and again, I remember that Bill and Ron were very much against this. And uh, I don't know about Rick, but uh, the two of them uh, really said, no, no, you cannot do this. Uh, you know, this will not work or whatever. But since we're, <clears throat> this very interesting uh, lesson I learned, since I was coming from a different field, not from NWP, at least I was willing to try it. <clears throat> and the same Gary. So we decided to do an, a one month run. If you go to the next slide. Uh, okay, go to the next one. This is just uh, summarizing what I just said. Uh, this is a slide from about 35 years ago. It's from a paper that I uh, co-authored with uh, uh, Gary Bates. So you can see that things were very, um, how to say, handmade uh, back then. Um, we did this one month simulation of January 1979, a continuous 30 day long run 
uh, now seems laughable to you or seems something kind of obvious, but back then was really something that nobody thought was possible. And I would say, I mean, we, we did have to do something, some changes in the model, but I would say we were kind of lucky uh, because the, the model actually worked. It's difficult to see from this slide because you can see the way we tried to do things. We were comparing this a precipitation field compared with uh, these uh, maps that we were getting from some, uh, uh, maybe Bill knows, uh, this agriculture uh, uh, network was producing, producing these maps every, uh, every month or so. Uh, and if you watch carefully, you can see that actually we were able to reproduce a lot of the observed features. In fact, I would say this is one of the best simulations that, uh, that we have run with, uh, with uh, different models that I've had. So it, has, it essentially worked. Um, for a long time, the NWP people were still very skeptical about this. Uh, Linda knows very well that it was very, very difficult to uh, get the, uh, on, the one, on, on the one hand, the NWP community to, to, uh, to uh, believe that this could be done. And on the other hand, uh, to discuss with the uh, GCM community that really didn't like this uh, nesting uh, nesting technique, but um, uh, it kind of worked. Uh, after we did this one month run and this paper, I think I consider this paper the first real uh, regional climate uh, simulation paper. Um, we proceeded to do a multi-year simulation. If you go to the next slide, uh, now you see the graphics, um, it's a bit better. Actually, Christine, I think, made these slides. This is a paper from uh, 1994. Uh, we actually did uh, two five-year continuous simulations, one for present day and one from for uh, double CO2, but then uh, double CO2 uh, global simulations were very popular. There were no transient runs yet. And you can see observations at uh, 60 kilometer resolution or 50 kilometer resolution. Uh, CCM1 on the bottom right, RxCM on the uh, bottom left. Uh, and you can see that there's definitely a big, uh, uh, big added value in, uh, in running the regional model. You get the signal of the topography in the Western US, um, much closer to observations. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is January uh, precipitation. I think is the average of the five Januarys of, of that run, or winter, I'm sorry, the average of the five winters. This is the change fields from the CCM1 and the RegCM. And you can see here really the philosophy, I think, of, uh, of uh, regional modeling. Uh, you can see that uh, the boundary conditions actually determine the uh, sort of large scale patterns uh, that are simulated also in the regional model. So you see here the yellow is a decrease in precipitation, the blue is an increase in precipitation. And this is very familiar pattern where you have uh, this uh, northward migration of the storm track. Uh, so you have more precipitation in, in the Northwest, more intense storms uh, in the Gulf of Mexico in the Southeast and drier conditions in the Southwest. And uh, you can see that <clears throat> the regional model more or less uh, in the global model have the same large scale patterns, but the details are what matter here. They can be very difficult. You see the precipitation shadowing effect of the uh, Western US uh, coastal, uh, coastal ranges and the Rocky Mountain um, effect. And the interesting thing here is that you see some areas that are yellow in one model and blue in the other one. Uh, in the lee or in the uh, downwind side of the mountains. And uh, so the, the precipitation change uh, sign is actually changing. And you might ask which, which one of the two is correct. And based on the fact that uh, the regional model is much better at handling topography, at least for this particular case, you might argue that uh, the top uh, picture is actually, is actually better. Anyways. Um, at this point, we realized that uh, you can do actually long-term uh, simulations and many groups in the world actually starting doing this. If you go to the next slide, 
These are some of the papers that um, I and Linda co-authored. These have really been fundamental papers in, uh, in uh, regional climate uh, modeling science. Probably the first one, the 1991 paper, is the most famous paper ever written uh, concerning regional climate modeling. I had some people like three years ago telling me, oh, still this 1991 paper, it's time that we, we, we write something else or something. But this just tells you how long uh, this paper has been uh, it's been a reference for our uh, modeling community. Um, and actually in this paper, we were uh, also uh, discussing uh, statistical downscaling and Linda actually uh, was the expert between the two on the statistical downscaling part. Uh, then uh, we had uh, sort of an update of this paper in 1999 when we, we developed, uh, actually, this is actually the year that I moved to uh, to Italy, just a few months after I moved to Italy. And the third one is uh, is uh, chapter 10 of the 2001 uh, IPCC report. Um, I and Linda were uh, both, uh, well, I was actually convening lead author and Linda was lead author of this chapter, but this chapter was really uh, extremely important for our community because for the first time there was an actual chapter uh, that was based on a regional climate uh, downscaling science. Uh, it was still a young science. Um, maybe the information was not as solid as uh, with the GCMs. In later reports, I think this was the third, the um, one, two, three, third report. The later report had reports had. Uh, much more robust information, but uh, again, this, uh, this, to me, at least to my eyes, this was a historical um, um, uh, publication. If you go to the next slide, interestingly, although regional modeling actually was born in uh, in uh, in the U.S. Uh, in Europe, it caught up very very quickly, and it has always been uh, quite popular. There were um, a number of fairly large European projects uh, dealing with uh, regional modeling and regional downscaling in general. Uh, you see here a list. Uh, I just want to mention the Prudence project, which I think was uh, has been one of the best uh, projects on regional modeling, at least that I've been on. Um, but then you see the sequence, and now we have a uh, this Eurocordex um, initiative which is a fairly big initiative. There are now, um, I would say, almost 100 um, um, scenario simulations for Europe at 10 kilometer resolution and now going to convection permitting. On the other hand, if you go to the next slide, for, uh, for some reason that uh, you know, I and Linda talked about uh, several times, but uh, at least I could never understand why, uh, this this technique was never very popular in the U.S. It took a long time to be accepted. Um, I know of these two projects. One was Perks, um, uh, and Bill, of course, one of, was one of the main uh, actors in this. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the acronym means. Project to intercompare regional climate something, um, and then NARCAP, of course which is Linda's, uh, Linda's project. And I have always been absolutely amazed that uh, she was able to, uh, to actually uh, get this project uh, funded and going, uh, knowing how difficult it was to get funding for regional modeling in the early days of, uh, of this research field. So I think this was at least what I consider uh, the greatest achievement that Linda had in uh, regional climate modeling. And she probably knows very well how difficult it was. Uh, if you go now to the next slide, uh, one of the most important things that have happened in regional modeling is the Cordex project. Um, I think Bill kind of mentioned it uh, very quickly in his talk, but uh, this was actually something very important for us because regional modeling by its very nature is very kind of fragmented. Everybody's interested in different, uh, in different uh, uh, regions, in different problems. And this was always one of the main criticisms that we received from, uh, from uh, global modelers that 
uh, our community was very erratic and it was difficult to sort of uh, intercompare results and so on. But at some point uh, we got together and uh, this is, I think, from a meeting in Sweden and I think Bill is there somewhere. I think you can see him hiding in the back, just like me. We are very shy, so we always hide in the back. Uh, this is the uh, uh, scientific advisory uh, team. Uh, I think the first scientific advisory team we had a meeting in Sweden in 2015. And for the first time after uh, two or three meetings and Bill knows also how difficult this has been, we were able to get all the community together. There was a strong support from uh, WCRP. Um, Gassem Asrar back then was the uh, director of WCRP and uh, Tony Busalaki was the director of J JSC and he was also very supportive. And Cortex has been, uh, again, it was a project similar to CMIP uh, 5, 6 or whatever. I mean, where, where the, all the models, ensembles of models share a common uh, simulation protocol. But this really was a major step up. This is when regional modeling really received the attention from everywhere. And, uh, and information from the Cordex runs have been used in IPCC reports. And, uh, and Cordex, of course, is still going. And I hope that it becomes uh, stronger and stronger. Next slides, please. I want to talk a bit about the future of regional modeling. We talked about the early days. Uh, where is regional modeling going? Uh, one direction is, of course, is uh, going to this convection permitting uh, type of resolutions. Uh, you see here a couple of slides from uh, Andreas Prain's uh, reviews of geophysics paper, and it's probably a seminal paper on the, on the convection permitting modeling. I don't know if Andreas is there, but uh, hi, Andreas, if you're there. Um, and uh, now, essentially, it's becoming a state of the art, but it's becoming quite common to run this model at uh, these models at convection permitting scales. Here in Europe, we have, of course, at Anchor, you've done this a lot, and Res and Rasmus and others. In other groups in the, U in the US have done it. Uh, in Europe, we have several projects now that are based on, uh, on these types of, uh, of uh, simulations where you actually go to the one kilometer, one or two kilometer scale. So a lot of the issues that Bill has talked about can be addressed very um, much easier than before. Uh, if you go to the next slide, the other uh, area that is uh, developing uh, very fast and a very important area is to the development of these uh, sort of regional earth system models, just like a global models now. Uh, we have regional models with coupled uh, ocean components, chemistry, ice, uh, biosphere, and so on. Uh, in Europe, we have a big area, so a few big projects uh, dealing, for example, for the Mediterranean region, for example, uh, Med Cordex, uh, the Baltic Sea region, where uh, there are ensembles of coupled models uh, being run. But if you go to the next slide, uh, this is what I consider the frontier of uh, regional modeling. There is a paper that I wrote with Andreas uh, a couple of years ago um, for uh, uh, PLOS Climate. Um, in my opinion, the next frontier in, uh, in, in modeling, in climate modeling, not just in regional modeling, is the inclusion of the human component in an interactive way. We know that we have YAMs, we know these very simplified models, um, or we have, uh, you know, impact adaptation, but this is all uh, one way. In my opinion, in this uh, in this new age of the uh, Anthropocene, uh, not having interactive uh, humans is uh, is a big uncertainty. Talking about uncertainties, and this is uh, again the next frontier in climate modeling because it's easy to increase the resolution. You can just push a button, and now with the big computers you have increase the resolution, the models can go to very high resolution. Uh, it's relatively easy to couple an ocean or a nice model because we know how to do it. But how to actually couple the human component in an interactive way is really, really very difficult. And that's where I think uh, the big challenge is. And that's where we need to go if we really want to do these, uh, these uh, digital twins of the climate system. So far, I've seen digital twins that are only 
high resolution models with uh, you know assimilation data assimilation which is something we already know how to do if you want to do something really different i think and difficult is to include interactive uh, humans so i'm almost done and next slide okay this is the dynamic duo uh, many years ago this is uh, during one of the happiest days of my of my life is the day when i got married in Boulder, actually, uh, you can see we were young and happy back then. Uh, actually, Linda was my, I don't know if you say best woman, but, or, or best man is also applied to women. But anyways, um, uh, she was uh, she was there for uh, for uh, our wedding. Um, and uh, what can I say? Um, I have as some of you know, Linda knows very well, I retired uh, one month ago, March 1st, and I really retired in the sense that I have stopped uh, doing research. As you know, many scientists never retire, at least they retire when very, very old. Uh, in my case, I decided that, um, uh, to leave, that I should probably leave uh, research to younger people, also because the world of modeling is really changing with this artificial intelligence and so on. Uh, and uh, I will do more uh, outreach, more uh, dissemination, uh, maybe some teaching. Uh, I will be working on uh, organizing some, some projects, but I will not do research anymore. But one thing that I can tell Linda is that you know, many scientists are really terrified by by retirement. They 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 start thinking, okay, what will I do uh, after I retire? And there are many things you can do. I'm actually doing different things and having a lot of fun uh, doing them. But the most important thing is that you don't have to spend your time arguing with global modelers about the added value of regional modeling. And this really really improves your life a lot. So I think uh, you should look forward to your retirement and uh, to, to go on and do better things. If you go to the next slide, just uh, thanks to everyone and uh, ciao to Linda. I hope to see you again, uh, either in, uh, in the US or, in, uh, or if you happen to be around Trieste, uh, keep in touch. And, okay, uh, um, maybe we have time for a question or a comment if anyone wants yeah. to say anything. Oh, well, we have Filippo, he's in Italy, so he's later there. <laughs> I think this integration of uh, an interactive human aspect with regional climate modelings opens the door for Bill. You can come back with your diffusion uh, uh, models of adaptation. <laughs> I think that will be an important uh, connection there to be able to have, you know, that kind of uh, technological and adaptation uh, being being modeled and incorporated into a regional climate model. So, so don't retire yet, Bill. <laughs> I got to think about that. Actually, talking yeah. about that, I think I think this issue of including humans can be done in many different ways. My, again, I'm retired, so I will not do it. But one of the things that I wanted to do, that I have been wanting to do for many years, is to to treat humans as aerosols. You know, I come from aerosol <laughs> science for my dissertation, and to have uh, bins bins of humans by age, by whatever, and. Uh, I think this could be a lot of fun to do. Let's <laughs> <laughs> treat them like aerosol. <laughs> Those are already there. Alison knows how to do this. <laughs> okay, thank you, Filippo. Um, we're going to okay, move on. Okay, bye bye, Linda. Bye bye, everyone. Wilkinowski is our next speaker. Um, so I think we're going to get you. You can share your own screen, hopefully, Bill. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Yeah. Just uh, one little thing about what Felipe just said. I, I know that some of us over the years have done this thing called agent based modeling, where we have humans running around in some of our simulations. Um, so anyway, but that's a different topic. So, yeah, what I want to talk about here and I want to thank the organizers for putting this whole symposium together, but um, I'm going to be focusing especially on NARCAP and how Linda used that to really elevate our regional modeling community and, and really start to form it as a, as a really a broad based community. So uh, the key points that I want to bring out and what I show in subsequent slides are the substantial efforts that, that Linda made developing NARCAP uh, community and the support for it. And the very insightful impact of, of how she framed the, the, the program and, and developed access 
through the, the, the program and, and especially the data sets, which leads into this, these broad continuing impacts. Um, as I'll note later, there are still papers being published using NARCAP output. It's continuing to this day. So, and I think that's largely an outcome of these first two points that I brought up here. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide, yeah. Uh, okay, so just a little bit of background for those of you. Um, Filippo touched on some of this already. Uh, you know, NARCAP was started uh, back 2006, although there were discussions before that leading up to it. And true to what Linda was always interested in, exploration and quantification of uncertainties and regional projections, things that Bill Easterling and Filippo touched on, wanting to bring in multiple high resolution regional climate scenarios, uh, especially for looking at impacts assessments mid 21st century, but also evaluating regional model performance and their uncertainties over North America, trying to really establish what regional climate modeling could do. And part of that was goes back to what Filippo was saying uh, moments ago, that there is, there's still a fair amount of skepticism about what regional climate modeling was capable of doing, something I'll touch on again later. And also as part of building a community, building promoting greater collaboration among US, Canadian and European modeling communities and really much even beyond that. Next slide, please. So, in the early days, uh, this is just one example of how Linda was just capable of pulling to so many people together. Uh, this is a list of what you might call the early uh, participants in this. Uh, there's some 26 people listed here, uh, some of whom unfortunately are no longer with us. But uh, you can see by looking at this that there are people from across the US, but also uh, people uh, from, from Europe as well involved. And also people involved with, with the global climate modeling community because that those GCMs were gonna be important uh, to what we did. And the, the thing to really emphasize though, is there was a broad spectrum of disciplines and talents that Linda was, was assembling here, bringing together a wide variety of people to really develop this whole community, trying to move forward with all those issues that I showed you on the previous slide that, that NARCAP was designed to uh, explore. And so in some sense, this echoes what Bill Easterling said earlier that, that uh, you know, Linda has always enjoyed working together with broad communities, even international communities and collaboration. And I think that's uh, really important. And as I'll show also going along the way, she made lots of people think across all sorts of different disciplines because of the way NARCAP was set up. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, one of the things that Linda did that was really important that Filippo alluded to was that she did a substantial job establishing funding for NARCAP. And so a lot of this came about um, with discussions that she had, and she, she would know far better than I would just how long and involved those discussions were with Jay Fine. I, I remember Jay as being a, a great NSF administrator, even when he was declining some of my proposals. Uh, I always enjoyed working with him. And with that foundation that she established with NSF, that led to additional funding. She sprung board that into funding from NOAA, DOE, uh, EPA, ultimately getting us about, for the program, about $4 million over four years. And this was back in the, the early 2000s when $4 million really meant something. Um, I would venture to guess that probably these days there's several homes in the Boulder area that cost as much as $4 million. But it was a substantial amount of money. It allowed us to really start to really come together as a community with, with appropriate support um, that was was really vital. And I would echo what Filippo said also about the skepticism about uh, regional climate modeling. One of the things that Linda would have had to work through with, with Jay was just that whole issue of skepticism. And I remember back around this time and even a little bit earlier, but well after Filippo and Linda's first papers came out, uh, some of the skepticism I was hearing from the global modeling community. Um, I remember going to this one meeting uh, of the working group on numerical experimentation, part of the WCRP, and uh, trying to promote some efforts we were doing with that old project to intercompare regional climate simulations or PERCs, trying to promote that project. And one fairly eminent uh, numerical modeler said, well, uh, regional climate modeling is, is just mathematically ill-posed. And at the risk of digressing a little bit here, digressing a little bit, uh, I wish I could had remembered at that moment what mathematically ill-posed meant. Um, 
one of the key features of it is that you can have the same boundary conditions to get two different solutions. And so that's considered an ill-posed problem. Well, without doing much thinking, you can recognize that global climate modeling, which has as its primary boundary condition, the solar constant, uh, is mathematically ill-posed then because for several values of the solar constant, including our current value, you can get two different stable solutions in your GCM, uh, the current climate and also an icy covered climate. So um, what I came to realize was this really wasn't about scientific exploration, trying to understand what we could do scientifically, but really just wanting to put up barriers to prevent us from moving forward. And so Linda deserves a lot of credit in that light with working with Jay Fine and actually getting this funding started for NARCAP and then going further and getting this additional funding from these uh, other agencies. So uh, yes, next slide, please. So the way this got set up was there was this set of four GCMs that she was able to engage to get their output, looking at 20th century simulations and a future scenario under what was then uh, the A2 emission scenario, the, the high-end scenario at that time. And uh, advance that one, one more little bit here, please. And that Fed uh, provided boundary conditions for six different RCMs listed here uh, at six different locations. Um, again, a con contemporary climate, 1971 to 2000, and then 2041 to 2070 mid-century simulations uh, as well. And I should also add, I'll touch on this again, we also were using um, the NCEP reanalysis as a further source of boundary conditions to evaluate what the models were doing with respect to the GCM driving, as well as when they had uh, observation-based boundary conditions. Next slide, please. And then related to all that, there is an effort to also bring in uh, a couple of uh, time slice global climate models all of these models were running at 50 kilometers resolution, which for the time was uh, fairly high resolution to be working at. As Filippo has noted, the advances in computing have allowed much higher simulation. But at this point in time, this is really pushing and stressing our uh, computational capabilities. Next slide, please. And so this domain got set up. Um, this, this was became the formal NARCAP domain uh, covering most of North America. And even this uh, is emblematic of, of Linda's care. This was not simply pulled out of a hat and where we said, oh yeah, this looks like this covers most of North America. We're good with it. Um, she actually had set up some initial uh, simulation experiments asking questions like, should the boundaries be farther east or west or the boundaries be farther north or south to get good credible ingestion of the large scale uh, conditions that, that fed the regional model. And this was what was eventually settled upon. Um, as a side note, I'll, I'll point out the, those, those two uh, Southern California and South Central US regions that were in this figure from uh, one of Linda's early papers on describing uh, the NARCAP program, because uh, some of my later figures will show something from those. Um, but again, this was really set up to be a, uh, uh, something that was established with a firm foundation, even for the domain that we were working on. Next slide, please. And so we got all these simulations over this big domain. As I said, it stressed the regional climate simulation capabilities substantially with six regional models and four GCMs. You know, there's a potential for 24 simulations plus those additional six from, with the NCEP reanalysis driving. And that was really going to be a lot. And this is where Linda really put a, a very important stamp on NARCAP by tapping into her statistical background and consult, consulting with other statisticians. She recognized that we can't simulate everything. What we ended up pair, pairing off here was uh, each regional model coupled with a, two different GCMs and each GCM providing boundary conditions to three different regional models, but in a systematic way. You, you can see that there are a couple of two by two sub matrices in here. Um, GFDL and had CM3 driving the ECPC and had RM3 models um, and another one. This is all not by random chance. It was a, a, a so-called balanced factorial, fractional factorial design um, that Linda set up. And it was designed to maximize the information that you could obtain from this experiment 
and do really credible, uh, insightful statistical analyses. And this was an important difference between NARCAP and other RCM, GCM programs, especially at the time. And I would have to add to that, that I know, and I can't remember names now, but certainly later on, I had other people who were leading other regional model programs who saw this and said, my goodness, I wish I had thought about doing this for our program. It was really considered a very useful way of setting things up. And I'm going to come back to this point early, later on. But this balanced fractional factorial design was really uh, an important way to set things up. Next slide, please. And another important aspect was the care that went up into setting up the regional output archive. Uh, various characteristics that are listed here, modeling it after some prior experiences, but uh, the main point being that we really wanted to set up an archive that was going to be well accessible to many people doing all sorts of work. It was going to have a very standardized uh, set of protocols so people could go in and start to understand what was in the data files, the data files produced by different RCMs. It was all going to be very much uh, something that was well accessible. And this became very important, a very important aspect of this project, which I will also talk about a bit more later. I want to give a special thanks to, to Seth McGinnis, who has been a longstanding part of, of the, uh, the really NARCAP and further on the NA Cortex community, really helping us make sure that our data standards were, were uh, at the highest level and promoting accessibility to the, the simulation output. Really, really uh, an important aspect of all of this. Next slide, please. So uh, some of the early results were basically saying, what kind of biases were we getting? And I'm going to show you some figures that were from various uh, old conference presentations that I managed to be to, to dig up. And these were really presentations maybe given by one person or another in the NARCAP community, but it was really the product of the community as a whole working together. Again, that community that Linda worked so hard to establish. So some of them were very straightforward analyses. Um, what were the biases? What are the biases over the domain or, or subdomains in terms of uh, seasonal averages of various types? So this figure here is from that Southern Plains area that I noted earlier and percent bias or uh, temperature bias um, for different seasons and for the annual average and highlighting perhaps some things that were like some some tendencies for say the had rm3 to have a fairly warm bias uh, uh, in, in from various simulations uh driven by different gcms other things like that but the main point here was that we were doing some what you might call fairly standard bias analysis uh and i'll come back further on that point uh later on here but next slide please and of course, looking at uh, extremes, this is that coastal California region where we were looking, this is one of the early results, looking at monthly precipitation extremes during the cold season, which is when there's the, the peak in precipitation in this region. Looking at the top 10% of monthly precipitation values over the contemporary climate period that we were looking at, uh, the black line is from observations from the University of Washington. The, the, the blue line is from the ensemble average of results from the different RCMs, and then that shading is the spread among the different RCMs, showing that there is, uh, on, on average, credible results. In addition, next slide, please. Also seeing that we are actually not getting things by random luck, but, but if we looked at what was going on year by year in the University of Washington data set, and then looked at what was happening, what years we were getting extremes in our different uh, RCM simulations, we were getting basically things in the same years. And so 49 out of the 50 per, uh, extremes that were there were, uh, were, were in the same cold season as observed, whereas random chance would have said we would have only had 22. So again, digging a little bit deeper, but seeing that yes, the models were actually producing interannual variability and precipitation and for the right reasons almost. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide further emphasizes that looking at the 500 hectopascal height anomalies, for these extremes and seeing that there is a broad similarity across the, the different RCMs that were involved here in producing the right dynamics leading to those extremes. Again, that there was not just random chance, but they were getting the right dynamics leading to it. So this deeper exploration into what was driving all of this. Next slide, please. 
But there is more. And going beyond just some of those those basics, and this is, again, going back to that paper that, that Linda published, uh, giving an overview of, of NARCAP, looking at things like intraannual variability that these models were simulating. In this case, the intraannual variability of winter seasonal temperatures and the ratio of the RCM variability to an observational data set, in this case, the University of Delaware data set. And noting that there are similarities, but also differences. And so there's a much deeper dive into biases and than, than simply looking at means and departures from means, but really asking, okay, what's going on with the dynamical behavior, year by year behavior uh, going on in these models? And this is one example of that. Um, next slide, please. And then also, this kind of echoes what, what Bill Easterling was talking about earlier, you know, does scale matter? And so just this one seems fairly simple type of analysis, but I don't recall people doing this very often, if at all, um, looking at time series of monthly precipitation, and then looking point-wise for each one of the grid points uh, coming from the models, and then also averaging over a box of three by three grid points, and then five by five grid points, and doing that same correlation and noting that the spatial aggregation, when you start to average things together, tends to improve the correlation with the observations. And uh, not surprisingly, the effect would differ across the domain, as you see here in these, this, these figures, but also with the model analyzed. But the real issue was basically asking, what are the relevant scales that we're actually getting out of these simulations? What can we say with, about something, uh, say, that gives us some degree of confidence? Next slide, please. But going on further, this is, again, where this balanced matrix that Linda uh, devised really became important. Um, What's shown here, this is from a, a further paper that Linda led in climatic change, um, was looking at the climate change and wanting to understand what are the con contributors to the uncertainty in that climate change projection, the differences that are occurring across simulations. How important are the relative contributions of RCMs and GCMs to the uncertainty? And what they were looking for, which was something they could do with this uh, ANOVA analysis that was permitted by that balanced matrix, was to say what part of that variance in the, or differences in the projections could be ex were the result of the GCM uh, driving or the result of the RCM behavior, or maybe not either. Maybe there's some residual that perhaps was um, a result of unforced uh, variability going on, or maybe some other factors that Linda and colleagues went into in more detail in the paper. But what you could see here are some things like with summer temperature, uh, GCM, the red was the dominant source out on the West Coast. But as you got farther inland, uh, especially in the mountainous areas, the RCM behavior was a bigger contributor. And then even farther east, the, that white bar, the, the residual is becoming more prominent. That's just one example. And the real key point here, again, is this was part of Linda's wanting to do a deeper dive into the uncertainty of climate simulations and understanding what the sources were and how important those different sources were for producing uncertainty. Not simply saying, well, there's differences and, we, and that's what it is, but actually trying to understand much more deeply. And again, the way Linda set up the NARCAP program was really vital for being able to achieve this. Next slide, please. And some other things. See, looked at, at factors like, like um, what is the significance and agreement of mean precipitation changes for winter and summer uh, coming from uh, the NARCAP simulations, but also comparing that to the four GCMs that were driving the NARCAP simulations, and then even more broadly saying what, what's going on with just uh, CMIP3, a, a large number of CMIP3 GCMs, and how much uh, are the four GCMs we're working with really maybe constraining things a bit, maybe not. Um, but again, uh, the, the field displayed here is the mean percentage change of precipitation across uh, the ensemble, each of these different ensembles and the crosshashed areas are areas that pass both uh, a significance and an agreement uh, criteria, criterion. Um, and the white areas are places where there might be some significant change, but not agreement. And what we can see in winter, perhaps not surprisingly, there is a fair amount of agreement, uh, although the RCMs are tending to show more intense uh, ch changes uh, in the, the, the mean precipitation. Summer, it's a, it's a much more mixed picture, suggesting that there's some things going on internally to RCMs and GCMs that are leading to differences, some of which Filippo, in some sense, indirectly alluded to uh, earlier, and which is shown on a little bit on the next slide. 
So this slide, again, coming from that same paper, they, they looked at uh, summertime, June, July, August climate change and temperature and precipitation for a central plains region. And if you look at this really closely, you start to see that, um, that there are differences between what the, the between GCM changes and RCM changes, differences in opposite sign, uh, especially for, for precipitation, which then is pre probably pointing to differences in just the dynamics of how each model produces precipitation in the summer. And again, kind of hearkening back to what Filippo was talking about earlier with, with the importance of convection and, and convection permitting uh, climate models, perhaps being something that even not then was being recognized uh, as important. Next slide, please. So there's other things though that went well beyond the basic science that again was were afforded to by the way Linda set up the whole program. So this is a, a review paper that Linda did with uh, Dennis Lettmeyer and Seth um, way back in 2015. And even by that point, there were over 30 publications that were using NARCAP output for impacts and adaptation studies, something that Linda was trying to promote obviously. Uh, with NARCAP and covering a wide variety of areas, hydrology, human health, wildfire risk, species distributions. So this was really showing that yes, NARCAP was being used not simply for analyzing the basic science, which was important, but also going beyond that to really start thinking about what is this telling us about impacts of climate change? And this continues onward. Next slide, please. So this is something from uh, a very recent search I made on Web of Science showing the impact across many, many disciplines. There's currently somewhere on the order of 200 publications that, that refer to NARCAP and use NARCAP output uh, even now. And all these different areas that show up, uh, different topical areas that appeared, um, water resources, of course, environmental sciences, ecology, um, oceanography, marine freshwater biology, geochemistry, geophysics, history different topical areas that are all showing, dealing in various ways with, with outcomes of the NARCAP simulation are really uh, important and, and substantial contribution uh, coming out of NARCAP. And again, this is continuing to this day. And again, this broad range you see of, of different uses of NARCAP output, uh, and this isn't even the complete picture here, um, is an outcome of, of the way that, that the NARCAP was set up and an, out of, out, bleh, an outcome of the uh, accessibility that was fostered right from the beginning in the data archive and wanting to make sure that the data really was available and could be worked with uh, very easily. Next slide, please. And <laughs> Linda even used uh, the NARCAP PIs uh, in, a, in a different offshoot of all this. Uh, she uh, is this paper's uh, title says, uh, she used the NARCAP co-PIs to do an expert elicitation uh, experiment with, with Melissa and uh, Vanessa Schweitzer, um, trying to see what us so-called experts could say about uh, looking at the differential credibility of various regional climate change simulations for the, the Southwest monsoon region of North America. Again, a further sign of Linda's creativity in terms of how you use model output. Uh, a lot of fun for me to be a participant in that, and hopefully they got something useful from us. Next slide, please. Then even beyond that, because of the way NARCAP was set up, as Filippo talked about earlier, lots of other simulation programs were going on around the world, and NARCAP uh, played a role in influencing how those were set up, and it allowed for, whoops, whoop, back one, <laughs> it allowed for um, uh, these cross comparisons to be uh, set up because we would have the similar similar models running in similar domains. So we could ask how, how do these results transfer from one domain to another, taking advantage of the GWACS observational uh, programs as well on top of it. And then finally, the next slide. And here, I just want to point out that this legacy is continuing. These are some recent NARCAP papers and, and I, I'm bringing these up because they're highlighting different applications of NARCAP NARCAP output, whether it's agricultural applications and that is in that first paper, um, evaluation of land use, climate change and uh, development practices on urban flooding. Uh, this third one here is quite interesting. There's somebody who's developed an AI based campus energy use prediction uh, for assessing the effects of climate change. I, I can't imagine that way back when NARCAP was getting started, we were thinking about AI applications, but there you have it. Uh, again, a further sign of how NARCAP is still relevant to many people. And then finally, a last one here, large, whoops, no, no, well, that's fine. 
large scale features of heat waves, um, a, a 2019 paper. And I would also point out there are some papers that are being published even now. I chose these because this showed the broad array of different applications, but there's a wide range. I mean, this paper is continuing to publish using NARCAP output even years later. And again, that attests to just the, the way the program was set up. Uh, Linda's great insight and in understanding how to set up a, a, a great program like this. And it, the legacy just continues. And with that, I will, you can go to the last slide and I will say thank you. And thank you to Linda, especially. Okay. And then, so I just want to say um, our next speaker here is Ruben Leung, um, who's going to be talking to us about Earth System Modeling for Actionable Science. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So, um, good morning, or actually it's morning to afternoon pretty soon. So, I'm really glad to be here for the MERN Symposium. Um, so, you might, wonder, <clears throat> you might wonder why my title is like this, right? So, I, I, when I saw all these other titles, I said, wow, these are great titles. Everyone has Linda's name. <laughs> and mine doesn't. But so I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of explaining why um, I, cho I have chosen a title like this. So Earth System Modeling for, for Actionable Science. So a paper that uh, Linda wrote uh, in uh, 2015, actually this was one of the later paper that uh, Bill also talked about. So there is a statement in that paper that says that regional climate modeling as a downscaling approach is to render global climate model results useful for impact research. So, so, so this is one of the goals um, of regional climate modeling as um, Linda puts it. Uh, but today we use a lot of different terminologies. Right? We, today we like to say actionable science, actionable climate information. I think NPA has, um, a goal of like providing actionable information and DOE for our web system modeling. We also kind of say that we are providing actionable science. So I think what it means is that we try to express our broader goals to support decision relevant research as well as decision making itself. And so I think Linda's research has significantly informed such goals because long ago she already recognized the importance of going down to a finer scale in order to support impact research. So in the next few slides, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about crossing paths with Linda. I'm using a timeline going from left to right, and you can tell which set of footprints are Linda's and which set of footprints. <laughs> <laughs> so I see my barefoot. <laughs> It's kind of chill. <laughs> so I started my research and postdoc uh, in the early 1990s. And when I started my postdoc at PNNL, my lab management talked to me and said, hey, Ruby, you need to look into like regional climate modeling because global climate models have such coarse resolution and we can really tell anything. At least for Washington State, that's where we are. Where, where we are. So for Washington State, we have so many mountain valleys and things like that. How can we even tell how climate change is going to affect our region? And therefore, I took up as my first project at PNNL to develop a regional climate model. So therefore, I was basically just following the footsteps of Filippo and Linda in regional climate modeling in my early uh, career. And then I kind of drifted off a bit. I was doing both global and regional modeling. And my first intersection of the, of the path with Linda was really uh, in 2001, when um, both NSF and DOE sponsored a workshop. So by that time, regional modelings were already making a lot of splashes. So the program managers was wondering, is regional modelling really something that we should be supporting in our funding portfolio? So you heard a lot of these type of uh, comments previously from the pool as long as from Bill, right? So, so then this is almost like a workshop, like a grand inquisition to see <laughs> is regional climate modeling really a valid approach? So Linda and I, together with Filippo and Rob Wilby, we organized this workshop called Regional Climate Research Needs and Opportunities. And, and then later, uh, this is in 2001, and then later on in 2003, we published a, um, a, a workshop report in BAMS, 
I was really <laughs> interesting because I haven't looked at this paper myself for a long, long time. So because I'm preparing for this presentation, so I went back and see what, what did we say about, what did we learn from this workshop? And I saw kind of like, you know, a big center of, of, the, of the report saying that we will soon see GCMs with 100 kilometer grid spacing, which most agree with will provide realistic global climate and large scale circulation for downscaling. Mm -hmm. So remember that that workshop was attended not only by regional modelers, there were lots of global modelers there. And the global modelers were telling us in 2001 that we would soon be seeing GCMs at 100 kilometer resolution, and they would be so good in providing <laughs> and take it into the downscaling. And so, well, boy, have we ever been right about GCM resolutions? Even when I think the people were starting to do regional modeling, people were already saying that, oh, in five years we would be doing 50 kilometers. <laughs> So that's, that's interesting. So in any case, I got a lot of help from Linda in really co-organizing that workshop. It was a lot of fun working with her and Filippo and, and Rob Wilby. And after that, I continued to do still some GCMs at global and regional modeling. And I visited NCAR in 2003 for the summer. And at that time, I worked with um, uh, an NCAR initiative called the NCAR Regional Climate Modeling Initiative. And the idea of that, of that initiative was to bring global models and regional models together, particularly because of the fact that at NCAR, we have the Wolf model, which a lot of people already started to use as regional climate model. But then, of course, there is this huge um, uh, effort in global modeling, CCSM. So then I organized another workshop back in 2003 and, uh, sorry, 2006. So this workshop was called Research Needs and Directions of Regional Climate Modeling, particularly emphasizing we should be using the WOLF model and the CCS, CCSM model and probably couple them together so that they become one single modeling system that we can do both global and regional. So out of that effort, eventually, scientists decided that maybe it's, it's not such a good idea to couple CCSM with WOLF. Maybe a better way to do it is to develop a new model, a global variable resolution model, where you can run a global model, but you can still zoom in in any particular region as you like to do a higher resolution. So this was hopefully to be a model that would really help pull the global modelers and the regional modelers together. Boy, it was a challenging part. <laughs> and I'm going to talk about that visiting back uh, at that later. So it's a challenging path to bring the regional and the global climate modeling communities together. But I will talk about that later, but continuing on my path, uh, the crossing path with Linda, <laughs> So then, at, by the time in 2009, uh, Linda already initiated the NACAP, which uh, Phil talked a lot about, so I'm not going to go much into the detail of that. So NACAP was the first um, program uh, in, in North America where we have this comparison of regional climate simulations. So it's kind of like an answer to prudence and ensembles. By that time, Europeans already have two rounds of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of regional model uh, in the comparison. So finally, we have one in North America because of Linda. Uh, so continue on, there were many papers published as uh, Bill already talked about. So this 2012 or 13 BAMS paper is one of those that really highlighted the NACAP uh, program and actually made a, a cover page for BAMS. And of course, a lot of the NACAP results later on were used in the NESTES report, which ultimately also featured in the National Climate Assessment Report, NCA3. Um, so lots of fun activities because of NACAP, so I'm going to highlight two. So um, Bill already mentioned, right, so we as the co-PIs of, of NACAP were used as human subjects <laughs> in this core um, expert elicitation. I find this exercise really creative and really a lot of fun. That was my first time to participate in something like that. As, as, as a matter of fact, the only time that I participated <laughs> in an activity like this. So just extracting a little bit from ultimate, I if I recall correctly, I think this exercise was actually done back in 2010. 
But then ultimately the paper was published in 2017. So I extracted some uh, important paragraphs from the paper. So here, in many contexts where scientific knowledge is evolving rapidly, yet policy decisions must still be made. Seeking the judgments of experts, experts elicitation can be useful for obtaining a more comprehensive understanding of the current state of a scientific field. So that was the motivation. And, and later on near the conclusion, I, I find this also quite interesting, which I just try to highlight here. So it says, this study suggests that research focusing on developing general use metrics is incomplete. General use metrics, meaning a lot of these metrics that we use like women's square error, correlation coefficient, just kind of by evaluating how well the model performed. It says, um, it, it, to, uh, the metric due to the important regional process, oh, so, so it's, uh, it's kind of it cut it off a little bit. Um, so essentially the idea is that unless there is community guidance on what appropriate differential weights for different phenomena should be, scientists will subjectively mm -hmm. determine appropriate weight themselves for themselves. So I think this is true because the scientists essentially, for, for example, for me, I work on the work model, other people work on the Rexia model. We look at our results and say, hey, maybe the precipitation is not so good. So then we will try to adjust something with the model and then maybe get the precipitation better, while other models might feel that other quantities are more important and then they will subjectively adjust their model so that they can better reproduce, for example, temperature or other fields. So, so that scientists already do this because in, in, in these scientists are already doing that. And that such subjective weightings can lead to different model evaluations came as a surprise to our participants. I think that was really interesting. So, so essentially, this is a kind of like a discussion about what metrics should be like and how should we be weighting the metrics. So this kind of discussion is still ongoing in the climate modeling community, very much an important discussion. And another discussion during that time, uh, so uh, Linda and I and a number of folks, we were invited to this mathematical science of understanding and predicting the regional climate a workshop in Singapore. So that was a lot of fun. I, I, I saw these pictures there. So you can see Linda, we can, you can see several folks from NCAR, like Doug Mishka and James Stone, and then myself. So, so it was a great workshop kind of discussing about the mathematical science of doing regional climate modeling. Uh, we also get an excursion for one day because it just happened that the workshop overlapped with the Fukushima accident. So many of us, including Linda and I, were supposed to fly to Tokyo and then fly back to the US. But because of Fukushima, then all the flights flying to Japan were canceled. So we got one extra day to look at <laughs> in Singapore. And was, it, was it really only one day? It seems like, I mean, one, one or two, I, I don't it seems like we were there for like months. <laughs> 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 so, so in any case, yeah, so these were kind of like during the market era. So now getting back to crossing paths with Linda again. So uh, in 2016, a project funded by DOE called FAXUS was mm -hmm. initiated. So that this project was led by uh, Bill Kratowski, but very much Linda and I were both involved in developing the ideas as well as working together uh, so Linda continued her pursuit on differential credibility, looking at like um, downscale future projections for, from both uh, statistically downscale methods versus like dynamical downscale methods. And then uh, also during that time, Linda and others, uh, like Melissa, they were working a lot on the North America, the Cortex experiment already. And then eventually in 2019, two projects. One is this Texas project, but then there was another project called Hyperion merged together to become a DOE project called Hyperfexus. This project is really interesting it's, and it's still ongoing. And, and I have, I'm still working with Linda on this. It has a very uh, excellent uh, stakeholder engagement component. Uh, so the goal of this project is to really see how well we can provide climate information for stakeholders uh, in the US to understand regional climate as well as regional climate change. 
And so we've been doing storyline simulations to see how specific extreme events, such as a, hurricane, a specific hurricane party or a specific MCS event, uh, look at how they might change in the future. So we perform simulations for the present day, but for the same event repeating again in the future to look at their changes. And I also collaborated with Linda on a paper led by Naomi uh, Goldenson that um, talked about just recently published the uh, use inspired process of re entered GCM selection for doing downscaling. Um, and then, of, of course, in 2000, uh, this is 2023, this type, I overlapped with Linda as members of FAST, but I rotated off um, this year. So it was also a, a lot of fun with working with Linda on many things. So now I wanted to spend a little bit of time to look at that. So where do we go from here on actionable climate modeling? Because we always emphasize that how important it is that we do climate modeling to provide useful regional climate information. So through NACAP, through CODEX, and a lot of these activities, where might we be heading in that? So remember when I talk about MPAS model, so I talk about the challenging path to bring the regional and the global climate modeling communities together. Yeah. So NACAP was designed to be a global variable resolution model so that you can run global simulation, but you can zoom in to a specific region. In this example here, we zoom into the uh, Tibetan plateau to do high resolution. In fact, just a few kilometers over the Tibetan plateau. And the hand model is also very flexible. If you don't want to run it in a global framework, you really want to stick with regional model. You can actually cut out one piece and run it as a regional model as well. But um, this approach has not taken um, off very easily because regional modelers are still very much, they still like to use the world model because it has so many options for physics. Folks will still say, I like this physics option because it works for me, for my region or for my application. So, so it has not been easy at all to actually pull the two community together. So uh, the MPAS model will not only have a atmosphere model, it also has an ocean model, it also has a sea ice model. All of these are using these what we call unstructured grid so that you can do variable resolution in a global modeling framework. So now NCAR has been focusing on this SIMA, which is called the Systems for Integrated Modeling for the Atmosphere, kind of like combining these uh, high, uh, high top uh, atmosphere model with high resolution model, et cetera, which can then be coupled to other ocean model or other components of the earth system for doing earth system modeling. And then at NSF, they have the Earth Works um, effort led by Dave Brando and Jim Harrell, and they are coupling the MPAS atmosphere model with the MPAS ocean model, thinking that this is a good approach because then the two models will share the same grid. You don't need to pass information using the so-called flux coupler. And then within DOE, we, uh, we use our spectral element die core for the atmosphere, and then we also couple with the MPAS ocean. Uh, so since I am from DOE, the Pacific Northwest National Lab, so allow me to maybe use a few slides to introduce our effort in terms of how we come <laughs> towards actionable science. Uh, so this is an effort we call um, Energy Exascale Earth System Model, so E3SM. So we also have a goal of providing actionable science. How do we do that? We have three different strategies. The first one is to go to higher resolution so that we can better model the extreme weather events in a changing climate, because this is really important, particularly we are DOE, we wanted to provide information for the energy sector to be able to understand how climate change may be affecting the energy infrastructure, energy use, et cetera. And then our second strategy is to look at the Earth system, not just from a natural Earth, Earth system perspective, because indeed the Earth system has been modified a lot by human system. So in this model, we represent natural, managed, and man-made systems together in an integrated framework called a human Earth system model to project the future outcomes. 
And then lastly, uh, an important strategy as well is to do ensemble modeling so that we can quantify uncertainty. So in this project, we work very closely between Earth system scientists together with computational scientists. So we can configure our model in many different ways, low resolution all the way to cloud resolving resolution. We call the screen model. It's a global three kilometer model, as well as configuring this kind of regional refinement where we can do high resolution only for a particular region where we have an interest. Like for example, we can zoom into the Southern Ocean where we can look at the um, Antarctic, uh, the ice shelf and the ice sheet and how it interact with the ocean. We can zoom into a particular coastal region to look at the interactions between the atmosphere, the land, the river, and the ocean. So this is one example of a global simulation where we zoom into the United States all the way to three kilometer resolution. We simulate the 2012 North American derecho. And so the derecho is known to be very difficult to simulate because it produces very strong winds like 30 to 40 meter per second. And so going through that kind of resolution uh, over the central United States, we were able to really realistically simulate how the 2012 North American derecho looked like and all the wind damages. And then we can perturb the simulation to look at how they might change in the future. Another example is simulating the super typhoon Mawa at 3.25 kilometer resolution using a regional domain. You can see the realistic pulsating kind of like energy coming from, uh, from, from the, um, the, the extreme weather system. So one nice thing, of course, about this type of simulation is that you can simulate extreme weather events really well. But still the biggest challenge is, is what about the climate? Because we're not just talking about weather there. Our goal is to be able to better simulate climate. Um, so another example uh, is that we developed this uh, unified variable resolution surface mesh where we can zoom into coastal region, for example, uh, so that we can do very high resolution there. And it's a single mesh covering the land, the river and the oceans so that these kind of interactions can be done much more seamlessly. And more recently, we, uh, we developed our global cloud resolving model. And so last year, we were happy to, to, to win the Golden Bell Prize for climate modeling, mm -hmm. running our model on the frontier. This is the first exascale computer on top 500 list. So we were able to get a throughput of more than one simulated year per day, running a global three kilometer resolution simulation, meaning that if you wanted to run like one year on this whole machine, you can get more than like uh, 365 years of simulation. So mean, meaning that this kind of approach might actually really become feasible in the future to do decadal or even century kind of simulations. Uh, so this is one example, looking at this type of three kilometer global simulations. So there is a, a, a project called Diamond where they compare global cloud resolving simulation. So often people would ask like, which one is the satellite picture? Which one is coming from the model? <laughs> I don't know whether you would like to play this exercise, but definitely. Uh, so what we are showing is the white blobs are these like very high clouds generally produced by mesoscale convective systems. But even at global three kilometer resolution or so, you can see also large differences among them, right? So some are really anemic in terms of the convection over the Amazon, for example. Some produce a lot of convection over the Amazon, meaning that even if you get to that kind of resolution, it doesn't mean that your results are going to converge and give you the correct <clears throat> answer. So here, uh, actually the upper, Left is the observation, and then all of these are model simulations. And you can see, um, and you can see that they, they do produce actually still rather different results, although they can capture MCS uh, quite realistically if they happen. Um, so there are lots of debates currently in the climate modeling community in terms of where should we be going in the future. Right? So in Europe, there is this big effort called Earth Virtualization Engines, called EVE where they are proposing that we should be doing global one kilometer climate simulations and climate projection to provide actionable climate information. So this is a graph showing the ensemble members on the upper, uh, on the y-axis, and then the resolution on the x-axis, as well as the, 
the amount of data produced by this type of model. So you can see uh, previously, for example, in the 1990s, the 2000 and 2010, mostly we were staying within the range of resolution, about 100 kilometer resolution. And more and more people, uh, modeling centers are producing more ensemble members. But as you go to higher and higher resolution, of course, then you cannot afford to do many ensemble members, which are really important to quantify uncertainty. So this effort suggests that we should need to push the boundary and do this type of kilometer scale simulation, not just for research, but actually for providing um, actionable climate information. And then, of course, there are also discussion about digital twins. So in Europe, they have the destination Earth. In US, I um, work on this committee, the, uh, the NISM committee, where we uh, produced a report late last year called Foundational Research Gaps and Future Directions for Digital Twins. Um, there are many, many perspective pieces that have been published in the last few years, all arguing one way or another. For example, a paper that argued that we need to do kilometer scale is, is needed for reliable climate prediction. And then paper that talk about using AI machine learning to harness the skill of AI machine learning to advance climate modeling. And then this one again also advocate for kilometer scale modeling is a new paradigm for climate prediction. And then there are also papers to even talk about less operationalized climate modeling because we are at a stage that people asking for climate information. And so in order to produce that kind of information, we need to operationalize climate modeling. And then another perspective paper by Beyond Stephen on the future of CMIP, <laughs> what should CMIP be doing? Should CMIP continue to do this kind of lower resolution kind of modeling if they are not producing realistic results? Um, and then in the US, we also try to come up with an answer to all of these mostly European <laughs> efforts. Uh, so we have a paper in review, envisioning US climate predictions and projections to meet new challenges. And lately I've been working with Tavio and Rob Wills on a piece where we advocate for a more balanced approach, uh, optimizing climate models with process knowledge, resolution, and AI. So with that, I'd like to conclude my presentation. So climate modeling for research and for supporting decision-making, we wanted both, right? Because climate models should be used for research, but it should also be useful for making decisions. But now we there have been a lot of arguments in terms of like, do we go to kilometer scale? Do we keep doing low resolution? How many ensembles members do we need? What kind of computers do we need? Can these goals, these are like two separate goals perhaps, can these goals be reached through a shared or coordinated path? I think this is a big question for our community. We are really standing at a point in time where they are really pulling in all different directions. I think informing this path requires bringing multiple lines of research and communities together. Because if we talk about providing actionable information, what does it actually mean? We need to talk to the stakeholders. Do stakeholders really want kilometer scale? Could this be an overkill? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. think about the um, huge amount of information that you are providing at kilometer scale. So I think you really need to have this kind of dialogue and different lines of research. You, know? you need modelers, you need people who work on impacts and adaptation, you need people who understand uncertainty, you need stakeholder engagement, et cetera, et cetera. So I think Linda's legacy has been, is really amplifies such convergence of different communities and different lines of research together. So with that, thank you very much for listening. Um, okay, we're on the room, so just making sure. Um, okay, so I'm st we're standing between everybody and lunch. So if anyone has um, a question or two or a comment um, for Ruby, we can do that, and then we will break until one fifteen. Mountain time, wherever we are. <laughs> yeah, Ruby, fabulous talk. Um, I love the idea of actionable science and trying to work out what the most important challenges we have uh, for climate change and basically how do we engage the stakeholders, as you're saying here, with relevant information. Um, personally, I struggle to get resources, you know, we're trying to do climate intervention and trying to work out like climate change impacts. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like there are a lot of different questions and they need different, maybe like 
ways of assembling our modeling systems to address that. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not a one fits all or one path. It's like all the paths together mm -hmm. so that we can ask those questions that are really relevant for tackling climate change. Right, yes. Uh -huh. I think this is a good point. I, I do think that both goals are important, right? First of all, we cannot just say no research because ultimately the backbone of any research, anything that would be supporting decisions should come from research. So we need both of them. And so many different approaches are available. And why should we only choose one? So, but but in any case, yeah, I think this kind of dialogue and discussion is really important. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm here. Oh, want to go? You can go. <laughs> yeah, one, one question. Um, this may be a naive question from a social scientist, but um, I'd be interested in um, hearing about with this increasing resolution, high resolution for Earth system models, climate models, how does that compare with the resolution of the observational data that we have, mm -hmm. whether it's global, regional? Do these line up or are they out of step with each other? And how does that play into these cascading uncertainties yeah. that you yeah. and Linda and others are, are dealing with? Yeah. Great point. Yeah, indeed, observation is always a challenge because do you actually have observation at that scale to support whether your model is actually doing better or not? But there have been also some uh, papers that, that were published that actually argue that now models are going beyond what the capabilities of, of observation, especially in mountainous region where you don't actually have a lot of observation. In fact, people have used climate simulations and run hydrologic models and then compare the results. And it turns out that actually using high resolution simulations to drive your hydrologic model can give you better results mm -hmm. than using the sparse observation and doing some kind of interpolation. But, but very much of research area. I don't think that we have a, a final answer. Okay. And I'm going to ask one thing, which I just want to see. Oh. <laughs> have you, so one thing we, you know, um, as a person who's come from the global modeling world to the regional climate modeling world and not necessarily sitting well between the two, um, there's the, been this push for these um, variable resolution climate models. But I don't see enough simulations being done on a long term time scale and comparing with things like WARF. And do you, do you know of things like that that just haven't been put out there? Or do you feel like this really, I don't feel like we really utilize variable resolution modeling for long term climate change very well? Yeah, really, really good question. I think in order to really get the buy in to the global, uh, global variable resolution model, doing very systematic comparison and analysis would be most basic, right? Because otherwise, you can convince people that this is a useful approach. There have been some papers published in that area, but I would say that we need a lot more. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Melissa and I are leading NA Cortex CMIP 6, mm -hmm. and we'd love to get you to yeah. do some runs for us. <laughs> <laughs> what, one more? I, I just want to point out in response to your question um, it, that there's the South America Affinity Group yeah, yeah. here out of Brow that has done the CSM, VR, yeah. WARF, and they have a really interesting framework that could potentially be utilized and expanded that would be great. Um, like for that. other areas. Yeah, yeah. America. So I, yeah, I just learned about that effort. So. Yeah, and we're doing it for Mesoamerica um, in the Caribbean. So, yeah, we'll we'll check check it as time. part of the Texas project, we were supposed to, to do that. Yeah, we, we should be running global variable resolution and take the fossil resolution part as boundary condition to run. Because we want to do it. Let's do it now. Thank you very much. So, we'll see you guys um, at 1 15. Those of you who are here, there's a cafeteria. Lunch is on your own, but we'll probably find spaces to sit next to each other.